Okay, it's time to get started. So hello, everyone out there in the world. Um, we are so excited to welcome you to Big Mini Conf today. We hope that you and your loved ones are all staying safe and cozy inside today um, and not suffering from the heat too much. So my name is Heather. I'm the program lead here at Code Chrysalis. And I have the honor today to present track A. Um, and so it's really, really exciting for us. So a little bit of background about what these big mini comps are in case you've never attended one before. Um, in week two, we give our students the option to present and research under the guidance of our technical instruction staff here at CC, um, something that they're passionate about, something that they're interested in. Um, they choose their topics when they're just two weeks into the boot camp, and it is done all outside of the strenuous workload and curriculum that we uh, put put everyone through here at Code Chrysalis. And so not only are the talks that you're going to see today um, incredible, but it's nice to think they've been prepared and researched and some of the demos and things that you're going to see that the students have built tonight have been done in just six weeks. So the people here are going to be particularly hardworking. Uh, like I said, they have chosen to do this all in the, uh, their free time and their spare time in addition to doing some pretty tough stuff. So I hope that you enjoy these talks as much as we have. Um, on the screen right now, you can see the schedule for today. And so we are going to start at a certain time uh, for each talk. So there might be a little bit of a lag time between talks. So please uh, feel free to get up and stretch and you know, grab a cold drink or something like that while you're enjoying these talks. Um, and yeah, without further ado, I'm going to uh, go ahead and let our first student get set up, who is going to be Scott Johnson. And he's going to be talking to us about the evolution of user-facing data and the gaming experience. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn my video off and mute myself and let's give it up for Scott. All right, let's just wait one more minute for it to hit one and I'll get started. Hope everyone's having a uh, good day. You might see my video cutting in and out. Apparently the uh, webcam gods are not with me today. But let's hope that they can hold out maybe for the presentation. If not, you'll just have to listen to my wonderful voice. Let's see, is it working yet? is Scott Johnson, and I am going to be talking to you about the evolution of uh, data and storage and APIs and how that's changed the gaming experience. So first, a little bit about myself, if my webcam isn't working, that is a picture of me on the right. Uh, my name is Scott Johnson. Uh, I used to, or I still do, but I love playing video games competitive, competitively. I used to be one of the top five elemental shamans in World of Warcraft for about two expansions. I've been Diamond in League of Legends, in both Summoner's Rift and also in the Teamfight Tactics mode and ranked. 
And I was also in the top 100 players on Player Unknown's Battlegrounds on the North American server. Besides playing video games, some of my hobbies include weightlifting. As you can see on the right, there's a picture of me at the Spartan Sprint, which is kind of a obstacle race, which also includes a lot of tests of strength. Um, I also really enjoy backpacking and the outdoors and listening to music. Uh, I'm currently working on my master's in economics, uh, my master's of science, so I'm planning on a thesis that applies sports economic theory to the world of esports, as gaming is one of my passions. And also because of that analysis or that love of like data, I am really interested in machine learning and data analysis. So that's kind of why I wanted to choose to talk about APIs. So, you know, about 30 years ago, you know, when video games were just starting to take hold in the house, it was such a different world than what it is today. Uh, you could like, you could only play with people that were right next to you. You didn't have the internet to get onto and the uh, storage was just not there. If you took the 40 million sales of the Super Mario cartridge, which only houses about 37 kilobytes of storage, and you combined all that storage into one place, that would only let you install about nine copies of the latest Call of Duty game, which takes up about 220 gigabytes. So that's a huge disparity in data you can see going from old games to new games. If you were stuck or you had a problem or you wanted to maybe get better at a game, Really, the only two ways of doing it was either just playing and putting countless hours in and trying to figure out what you could do better, or you could be using one of these old strategy guide books and try and rifle through them and study them and see, you know, see what you could learn from them. I don't know if anyone here has experienced using these, but these were one of my favorite things uh, studying when I was a kid. And if you didn't have these books or you wanted maybe customized solutions or customized advice to your situation, it was really hard besides asking your group of friends to, for um, advice, you didn't really have anywhere else you could go to without the internet. One like customized solution that existed back in the day, at least in America, was Nintendo had this thing called Powerline to the Pros, where you could call these people on your phone and these people would be able to help you and answer maybe any problems you had. And when you were looking at calling the site or like in the paper, they had like profiles of any game counselor that you were like, that they had, and then you could figure out kind of like a dating profile which game counselor was gonna help you get better at the game you wanted. And how are these people um, getting the data or being able to help you through your problems? They just had binders with pages and pages of data with every single map printed out and they would have to try and rifle through and try and find where you were at and try and give you advice based on just these small printouts or snapshots of the levels. Since then though, lots has changed. Obviously, you know, cell phones, internet, data, there's been the world now from 30 years ago is completely different. So about the increase of storage in 2002 alone, a study by Berkeley found that around five exabytes of new data was produced and five exabytes is about 5 billion gigabytes for people who don't know what that is. And last year alone, around one zettabyte of new data was produced and stored and that's around 1000 exabytes. So you can see from year to year, the amount is gonna keep growing exponentially as we keep housing more data and we keep realizing the value of data and how we can use it. Um, we're trying to make more and more storage to store all that data. And along with the increase in storage, um, internet uh, access and speeds are continuing to rise. Now around over 4 billion people have access to the internet and that number is only going to increase when things like Starlink satellites are online. And so more people are going to have access to the internet and people's uh, average connection speed is around 43 megabits per second. So we can actually access quite a bit of data from the internet at fast speeds now. And more uh, the way that's changed, the way the internet speeds have changed and gaming, uh, now online on YouTube, you can go and you can see playthroughs of any game you want to. You can see multiple playthroughs and you can see how from start to finish how people play. On Reddit and Discord, you can find communities for your favorite game and you can interact with people or talk with people there or try and get customized advice from your solutions. No longer do you have to call someone and try and see if they can look through a binder to find the right page for you. You're going to be able to access someone's experience and see what they did in that same situation. And finally, Twitch, which I don't know how many of you know, but it's a live streaming site where you can also find communities centered around a person playing a game or a set of games. And you can try and connect with people that share the love of your same games as well. And more importantly, um, from this increase in internet speeds and increase in data has been APIs and the increase in uh, companies allowing to access the data that they're collecting about their games. So what does API stand for? It stands for Application Programming Interface. 
And for the purposes of my talk, it's essentially a portal or basically a hole that companies allow users to access certain parts of data about the game. So what games do have APIs? Um, pretty much every popular game nowadays is going to have APIs, Fortnite, Escape from Tarkov, Hearthstone, League of Legends, Dota 2, uh, the newest Call of Duty game. Uh, all of these have very robust APIs that allow you to access a lot of data, but really uh, most games nowadays will at least let users access some small amount of data as well. So what can you access with APIs? What kind of data are companies allowing you to see? Uh, in Blizzard's card battling game Hearthstone, you can look at things such as class win rate. In a popular MOBA game, League of Legends, you can access complete match history for a player and you can see player stats for everyone inside of that match. Um, Fortnite, which is a first person shooter battle royale developed by Epic Games. You can look at KDA, which stands for the number of kills, deaths and assists. You can look at the number of wins or even the people you played with. And in an online RPG, World of Warcraft produced by Blizzard, you can even get access to everything that's happening in real time in combat. And you can calculate the damage your character is dealing every second. And you also have access to knowing what kind of battle events are happening as well. So for my project, I'm gonna do a quick demo to show you kind of how you can use data from APIs and how you can kind of get started for accessing these data and building an app around data from APIs. And for my project, I'm going to be using the League of Legends API produced by Riot Games. And so let's get into the demo. So first, if you were interested in going and going, uh, you wanted to go to the website to see what they had, we'll move over. And then you would have to go to the developer portal. So here we can see we're at developer.riotgames.com. It's free to sign up. All you have to do is make an account and you get instant access to the API and they have very extensive documentation on their website about the whole API. So you can scroll through, as you can see on the right here, there's so much data that you, it's very well documented, very easy. If you're curious, if you can access something, you can look through here and find it. And then get onto the APIs. If you just click on the API page, we're taken to a list of all of the endpoints or places that we can access data and you can see everything that is available to you. So for example, if I click on this match endpoint, we can see you can get match by match ID, get match lists for games played on given account ID and platform ID and filtered. And there's just more and more things. So I decided I wanted to build an app for over the weekend to kind of show you what you can do with this kind of data. And so I took four APIs from this uh, four endpoints from this API, and I built just a quick um, North American solo du duo queue ranked analysis app. So essentially what this will do is let us uh, pull up our own matches and then see what we can maybe have done better in some matches or try and figure out what points we could have improved on to try and become a better player. So here you type in your summoner name. I don't have so much to play anymore, so I'm going to use my friend Rhinoceros's account. And then we want to filter by a champion because we want to look at how you are performing on a certain champion to try and improve maybe performance on just one specific champion. So I know he loves to play a lot of Jinx and we'll search. And it takes just a minute for it to load up because we're actually making 12 API calls or 12 requests for data to get the cards that I'm planning on loading. And the cards load. And so now we can see here some cards with kind of match summary for each match with some sort of information like date of the match, uh, match ID, whether they won or lost, which is also color coded here by the blue or red, as you can see, gold earned, their KDA, which again is kill deaths and assists, and then the CS, which stands for creep score or minions killed. And this is essentially how you gain gold and how you gain power in this game. So we're looking to improve. So we probably want to look at a loss. So see what we could have done better to maybe turn that loss into a win. So let's choose maybe this one from a few months ago. So if we tap on this, I've also made additional data where it then takes that match and it asks the API again for detailed information about that match that's happening in every minute and seeing what we can gain from there. So here we have two graphs, gold gained and minions killed. And these graphs are usually gonna mimic each other pretty closely because as you do kill minions, that is the main way of getting gold. 
but what we would be looking for maybe just from the simple kind of app would be flat points in the app or flat points on the line because every minute you're always trying to get more powerful any time that these lines are going flat means that you're maybe not becoming as powerful as you could be because you're not gaining as much gold as you need so we can see here between 12 and 14 minutes we actually didn't kill any minions and then here again there's another like two three minute stretch where that's not happening so from here i could maybe go to the replays of the matches and go to those timelines and see what's happening and see kind of think about how i could change or how i could make decisions better to maybe for the next time that happens so that's kind of what my app does um, I would like to do more with the app, like add more graphs, or if I could make API, more API calls, I would like to add averages so that you can compare your gold gained compared to people around your same skill. But unfortunately, I only have a hobby developer key and they kind of limit the amount of requests that you can do. So let's go back to the presentation. Great. So for this app, I just used four technologies. Um, React was used for the front end for the developing for the looks of the website. Um, I used Node.js and Express.js for hosting the server to interface between the API and my front end. And then Canvas.js was used to create the charts that you saw. And finally, this last one is Material UI, which is a, just a set of components that uh, look nice. So it's just used for styling on my website to make a more professional looking website quick, uh, quicker. So kind of you can understand maybe what you can do with APIs, but how have they changed gaming or why, why are these such a big deal? So now compared to maybe 30 years ago, I think research is as if not more important as playing the game you can gain much more experience through maybe 10 minutes of researching or 20 minutes of researching than you could hope to gain in hours and hours of playing. And so I'm gonna show a couple APIs that people use that I think really demonstrate that. So first, this is a API or website app called ProBuilds, which is for League of Legends. This gains, or this shows match data played by pro players in the game. So these players are playing the game most efficiently. They're at, the top, they're at the top level and they have analysts feeding them data even. So they're making what we can assume to be optimal choices. And now with this website, you gain instant access to all of their research as well. So let's say I was a top player in League of Legends. I could click the top button here and it brings a list matches of people who play uh, famous top laners or professional top laners. And we can see what they're playing right now to see what's currently strong. And immediately I can see six of the same champion being played just in the last 10 matches. So I, this champion is Camille. And because of that, I can assume that Camille is a really strong champion. And if I'm playing top lane, I should probably learn this pick because people are really, uh, it's becoming very popular. It's very strong. And we can, we always want to try and make optimal choices when we're playing. And so if I want to kind of gain more information than just what's currently strong, you can click on one of these matches and it'll bring you a detailed breakdown of the game. And you can see exactly what order pros are buying items in. And that's the efficient way where their stats are increasing at the most efficient levels. And you can also see what order they're leveling their skills into down here. And down here, and that finally at the bottom, you can see um, what runes or what um, additional abilities they're choosing to make their champions as strong as possible. And for an example of another game, uh, for Hearthstone, which is the card battler by Blizzard Entertainment, we have hsreplay.net. And on the front page, you can immediately see um, which classes are playing strongest, but more important than just classes. Oh, let me change the pointer here. That might be a little bit easier for you guys. You can see exactly what archetype or what specific deck is performing the best. So because Hearthstone is a card game and you have to pay money to buy these cards, um, sometimes knowing what deck you want to build or what deck is strongest um, allows you to choose what you're going to build and shoot, be able to plan your purchases efficiently. But more even uh, interesting than this, I think, is they also do detailed matchup data. So they have kind of win rate, win rate ratios of certain archetypes of decks going up against other certain archetypes of decks. And how I could use this as a player is say I'm really having a hard time playing against Weapon Rogue. It's really hard for me to beat Weapon Rogue. 
I can look at this chart and I can look at what decks are doing really well against Weapon Rogue. And maybe I can decide to start playing that. If when I'm playing, I'm seeing a lot of the same deck, I can choose to use a deck that's going to perform better against it and then climb in rank to become a better player. All right, next, I think now more than ever, not using APIs actually puts you at a disadvantage because research is more important than playing, I think. If you're choosing not to use these, you're basically lowering your skill compared to what it could be. So to kind of illustrate this, this is a screenshot of a 25 player raid in World of Warcraft. And so this is 25 people playing together, trying to beat or defeat a monster. And coordinating 25 people can be kind of a challenge. You're trying to coordinate all the people and you're also trying to see what's happening during the battle and make sure that you're doing everything right to beat the monster. So this screen has a lot of add-ons going on, a lot of things that people have created using the API to help track data that's happening in the game. And I'm going to lay out just a couple of them so you can see uh, how they might help. So first in the middle, we have event encounters. This is kind of saying the important things that are happening in the fight that you need to keep track of or make sure or know that's happening. So here we can see that the celestial protector switch targets. So I need to know that I need to switch and start damaging that. Down here at the bottom, we have raid performance stats. Not every time you fight these monsters is a win, unfortunately. Sometimes you die and you have to try again. But here you can see exactly what happened during the fight and you can see if maybe someone wasn't pulling their weight or see what problem spots were and trying to fix those. And last, um, keeping track of raid cooldowns. Raid cooldowns are powerful abilities that unfortunately take you can only use every so often, maybe every once every five minutes or 10 minutes. So they're very powerful, but you have to use them very sparingly and you have to know when they're available. So instead of asking one of your players in your raid if it's up or not, this keeps track of your entire party's important raid cooldowns on the side. So you can see when they're going to come up and when you can use them. The next way I think APIs have been really important lately is that there's less responsibility for developers to develop fringe features for the user experience. Now that people can do these things like add things onto the application as it's running, um, if people feel that something for the user experience is missing, they can actually just add it themselves. And there's, for better or for worse, the developers don't need to worry as much about making sure their um, application or game is complete upon um, shipping. So this is an example of an overlay app for a auto battler called Teamfight Tactics. It's the blitz.gg app. And these three highlighted things are things that are added on by the app. At the bottom, we have an interactive item cheat sheet which is keeping track of what items build into what items. And then on the right, we have the real-time rolling chances for each tier of units. So if you're trying to get a specific champion and you know what the percentage chance of getting that is. And then at the top, we have the uh, pinned teams for quick access, which is keeping track of powerful compositions currently in the game. So you know exactly with what champions you have and what um, composition you're going for, what pieces you're missing or what you need to aim for. So it helps. This helps you because you're making decisions every minute on a timer in this game. And there's so much data to kind of parse or process that sometimes you won't be able to evaluate all the choices fast enough and you'll end up making suboptimal choices. So this app helps uh, remedy that by giving you more information on the screen at a time. And this one isn't necessarily something that helps you play better, but it is kind of a user experience, a fun feature that was developed from an API. This is for Hearthstone Battlegrounds, which is another auto battler produced by Blizzard. And this is called Bob's Buddy. So essentially what happens in this game is that you have seven monsters that you, as you can see down below, and you're going to be paired up with another player and your seven monsters are going to attack randomly. And either if one of your monsters is left, you win. And if your opponent has monsters left, you lose. So since everything is random, it's very hard at the start of a match to see which way the fight's going to go. But this, uh, with the data from Blizzard and the API, you can actually calculate all of the possibilities that are happening during this match. And you can see what your percentage chance of winning is, what your percentage chance of losing is, and even if you might die or if you might kill your opponent. So it's not necessarily gonna help you make any decisions differently, but it is kind of a fun user experience where you can know immediately whether or not you won. So if you're interested, or these apps seem kind of like something interesting to you, um, how do I get started building apps with APIs? Um, the easiest way is going to the developer portal for the game you're interested in developing for, 
almost every big game company is going to have some sort of developer portal with documentation about the API and also how to get started with getting a key to get access. So we have Blizzard, Riot Games, or Epic Games. But if maybe the apps that I showed towards the end with actually displaying stuff on the screen as you're playing the game, if you're interested in making more of an app than a website, I want to talk a little bit about something called Overwolf, uh, which here's the um, GitHub link for that. So what Overwolf is, is a software development kit aimed for these kind of on-screen as you're playing the game applications. It's developed by Curse Gaming. And it really sets you up with a great framework for building an app for a game if you're interested. It has things such as it will display tooltips on certain features of your app when a user uses it for the first time so they can really understand how to use your app properly. It has different views for the app as well. You can have an in-game app if you want, like an overlay, like the World of Warcraft one. You can build just a regular desktop app like the website I built if that's something that interests you. Um, it has a companion screen for people who are playing games with two monitors to have live data displayed on the side. Or even if you know you want to contribute to the online kind of live streaming community, you can build Twitch extensions for a game you're interested in. So it really helps you very easily build quality apps that are very dynamic and are really enticing for users to use. The only downside to Overwolf is that you actually need to submit a proposal and have it approved before uh, they give you access to install your API and test it. So you need to make sure you have an idea of what you want to do. You can't really go and mess around with Overwolf before you have an idea. So in conclusion, um, I think that the benefits to APIs or the benefits of APIs have really helped A, level the playing field maybe. There's not so much natural skill triumphs over all. You can overcome maybe a natural skill deficit by smartly researching or deciding what you're going to, how you wanna get better making an action plan and accessing this data to get better. I also think that um, these on-screen apps are be, be, going to be the wave of the future. More and more you people want this data happening in real time so they can make choices as it's happening and try and make the best choices every time. So if you're interested in developing these on-screen apps, I think now is a better time than ever to get started. And that's it for my talk. Thank you so much for listening. If you want, you can reach out to me on Twitter at my handle Svatness. On Instagram, it's SS Johnson, like my name. And finally, my GitHub is Scott Johnson 63, which you can look at my uh, Riot Games API or other projects that I've worked on. And if you want to try out this app that I displayed uh, during my demo for yourself, there is a QR code. I deployed on Heroku. Uh, it does only work right now for North America servers, so you would want to test it out with that. But that's it. Thank you so much for my listening, and I hope you guys have a great day. Okay, Scott, thank you so much for that awesome talk. Uh, no, I know it can be nerve wracking when you have issues with the webcam, but I thought it was amazing nonetheless. And uh, yeah, really super cool to see your passion for this content. So awesome, awesome work. Okay, so up next, we are going to have Yuta. So Yuta is going to be telling us about the ABCs of machine learning on Unity. Um, and that talk is going to be starting at 1.30. So everyone take a quick break and we will get started with Yuta in one moment.
Okay, it's 1.30, which means it's time for our next talk. So everyone, let's welcome Yuta to the stream. Okay, so can you see my screen? Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you all very much for coming today. So my name is Yuta Nomoto. Uh, today I'd like to talk about reinforcement learning. So my talk title is Unity Reinforcement Learning for Everyone. And uh, the easiest way to make your first AI laboratory with Unity ML agent. So let's get started. So how do you feel when you hear machine and reinforcement learning? So some of you may think, oh, it's for me, uh, that's nice. And some of you may feel uh, it's not related to me, but don't worry, I will talk about what it is shortly. And our main theme today, Unity ML Agents, is for both of you. So it's an easy tool that you can make your own AI laboratory. Sounds nice, right? So let's see today's agenda. So first, I talk about what's Unity. And next, what's Unity ML Agents? Then brief introduction to artificial intelligence. And let's make preset agent work. And let's create our new agent. Finally, application to real game and how to get started. Okay, by the way, who am I? I think you are wondering. So let me introduce myself briefly. So my name is Yuta Nomoto again. So I major law and political science at the university in Tokyo. After graduation, I worked in a Japanese industrial electronics manufacturer and experienced three totally different roles. So first was sales and marketing of the innovative lithium ion battery. So our products are on these electric car or eco-friendly cars like Mitsubishi and Honda's 100% electric cars and any charge system, which is on almost every car by Suzuki. And next is the new business development of Plant Factory, which our company had started business as a truly new business. So it's a vegetables growing in a clean room with just fluorescent light and pure water. So we don't have to wash the vegetable even once before we eat, so we could feel the real taste of vegetable, which we cannot taste nowhere else. So lastly, I handle the international trade business, especially for the thermal power generation facilities. I was mainly in charge of handling the business in the United States, and this is almost the same product we provided to the utility companies. It is very huge and sometimes take more than a year to make. Then why I'm at Code Crystals right now. So this is because of my inner motivation. So I like something new, innovative thing that can give users delightfulness and surprise, delivering new value. So that's why I chose my previous company and projects. So, and I highly appreciate it that I could work for those diverse categories of projects. But I noticed that I could only work for business part like this. So I want to create an innovative thing by myself. So I want to pass the clear and the intersection of business and design and engineering. And I finally realized that this intersection is a software engineer. That's the reason I quitted my previous job and joined Code Crystalist and now speaking in front of you. So let's see today's agenda again. So next topic is what's Unity? Okay. So Unity is a game engine for everyone. Democratizing game development is the word 
by founder of Unity, David Helgerson from the United States. So this means Unity is aiming for the realization of the open world where everyone can start making games. That's nice. So before Unity, each game companies had individual hidden game engine like this. So these are each individual game companies. And this means these technologies cannot interact with each other. And engineer also can communicate or change companies with each other. So it was very inefficient. After Unity, it unified literally all the game development environment. So since then, Unity is said to has dominated 50% share in mobile 3D game. And 3D 3 billion devices using Unity around the world. So according to the market report, smartphone games market is about $64 billion. So it's very huge. Okay, so let's move on to the next. So next is what's Unity ML Agent? Okay, so its full name is the Unity Machine Learning Agents Toolkit. So it's a plugin for making learning environment for reinforcement learning. And it's, it unites Unity environment with Python scripts for running. And it has more than 15 preset examples. And you can use this toolkit uh, without deep knowledge of machine learning. And its first release was 2017. And its latest release is almost two weeks ago this month. So, and as you can see, uh, it updates so frequently that you have six updates in 100 days. So you can tell how enthusiastic the developer and community is. Okay. And its mission is allow game developers and AI researchers alike to use Unity as a platform to train and embed, and embed intelligent agents using the latest advancement in machine learning. It sounds perfect, right? So next is brief introduction to artificial intelligence. So what's the difference of these terminologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, Reinforcement learning, deep learning. So there are so many terms related to learning. But uh, don't be afraid. Let's digest one by one. So what's the difference? Uh, let's think about a box representing whole artificial intelligence category. So there are two categories in the AI rule-based and machine learning. The brain of rule-based AI is written by man and they are if then type. The AI utilizes the rule to make inference. On the other hand, machine learning utilizes data and algorithm to make inference, meaning there's no rule made, no rule made by man. In these two cases, only rule-based AI has limitation of intelligence by man's reasoning. In machine learning, there are four types of learning. First is supervised learning, and then unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, and deep learning. So today's main topic is, of course, inform reinforcement learning. So let's dive into this. So, okay, so, okay, so what's the reinforcement learning? So in short, it's a way to run a better action from experience and, okay, so, um, like babies trying to walk by themselves, like this. So what's the reinforcement learning? 
For example, here's an entity called Asian. Asian is an entity which will act and learn in a certain place like this. And this virtual place is called environment. Environment always has a certain state. S, for example, this chocolate is a state. Agent is a state and decide what action to take. This probability is that the agent will take action A is in a certain state. S is called policy. Then the environment will return the reward or punishment depending on the action. This reward is called immediate reward. So there is another reward called accumulated reward, which the agent will get in the future as a result of actions. So the purpose of the reinforcement learning is maximizing accumulated reward. So sometimes there are conflicts between immediate reward and accumulated reward. For example, if you eat chocolate, that's good for your immediate joy, but it's obviously not good for your long-term wellness, right? So basically, uh, what agent has to do is improving its policy, which is the probability the agent will take a certain action from try and error so that the agent's long-term reward is maximized. Okay. So now that we understand what reinforcement learning is, so let's dive into the sample demo. ML agents has many presets that you can play with after installation. So today, let's have a quick look for 3D ball at the top left. This one. Okay. So I think you can see the demo screen. And here you can see 12 agents and its mission is to control the ball on top of their heads. So it means they don't, they shouldn't drop the ball. Okay, so let's play first manually. So in order to do that, uh, let's show the keyboard here. Okay. So they don't have any policy or brain right now. So they don't uh, work automatically. So we have to control. So, but they work uh, synchronously. So let's see just the top left most one. So like this, if I push the cursor, uh, it will tilt sometime. But as you can see, it's uh, very difficult to keep the ball just top of the head because it's very sensitive. So I have to push the cursor so many times. Okay. But when we apply the brain or policy like this, and let's change the uh, view. Okay, this time, uh, they now get the brain or policy. So they don't drop the ball anymore. And as you can see, it is working so hard not to drop the ball from their head. So, and you can see it frequently moves like I did by my keyboard, but now they are just doing by themselves. Okay. So let's go back to the slide. So next is our term. So let's make our original entity and make it learn. So when preparing our agent, there are two ways. First is creating our own 3D model from scratch using software other than Unity. Or the other way is you try 3D model assets Unity has. Because creating 3D model is not today's theme, let's go utilize uh, asset parts, okay? So today I'm going to use Unity Offshore Free Asset. So it's called Unity Charm and it's the original character made by Unity itself, okay? So we can utilize this 3D model if we show license or character logo like this. Then let's go to the demo. 
So here, you can see the entity here and target box here and field here. The purpose of the agent here is to chase and touch the box wherever the box appears. So first, let's make the agent run from zero. So right now, it don't have any policy. And we can start running just using this console. So let's run. It takes some time to start. Okay, so when this Unity logo appears, it means we are ready. So let's push start. And when it starts, the console shows the current status of running. And you can see how the agent is working right now here. But as you can see, uh, it works very awkwardly, right? So the purpose is just go straight to the box, but it seems it doesn't know what to do or just it kill itself. So it's very weird. That's because it has no brain right now and it doesn't know what to do. So it just doing try and error so many times. So uh, which way to move or what to do. So, okay, let's stop this because it takes time to complete. And so we have uh, uh, already learned brains here. So let's apply the 100 try and error brain here. And let's just change the speed. Okay. This time you can see the 100 times run uh, computer brain. Okay, but still it works very awkwardly, right? Uh, it doesn't recognize the box or it still kills itself. Okay, then let's move forward time. So 50,000, no 5,000. So this time it looks a little bit better, I think. Uh, it can sometimes touch the target, but apparently it still uh, need more time to get used to this activity. Okay, so let's next is a 50,000 model. So actually 50,000 time is enough for human or we can even do the same thing 50,000 times, right? And, but for the computer, yeah, it might be enough. So we can see much improvement here, but it's not so totally straight, right? So sometimes it still moves awkwardly or not so straight. So finally, let's apply the 500,000 model. So uh, of course we humans can do the same thing 500,000 times, but computer can, can do. And it's yeah all enough for computer as well, right? As you can see, uh, this time it chases the box very well and yeah, it's like hunter chasing the horse or something, right? So, okay, let's stop this. Okay, so the next and final section is application to real game and how to get started. So now that we understand how agent will become cleverer, let's see the real use case. So here is a simple but real application of ML agent to the game. It's called Pupo. So let's see the demo movie. Uh, so here, when user threw a branch to the dog, it can get the branch to the user. So he is trained using ML agent to be able to walk, run, jump, and get the branch. At first, 
like Unity Jam, the dog didn't know what to do and even can't walk properly. But after many times of practice, it became such smarter, like the real dog, right? Okay. So let's go to the next. So if you are interested in this technology, uh, using the following documents, you can play with ML agent from today. I have three recommendations. First is a Unity official site. He has many articles explaining what you can do with ML agents. Those are helpful. So second is official GitHub documentation. It's a very decent guide that you can make your laboratory following the step-by-step -step explanation. <laughs> so it's already so popular among developers, like it has 9,000 stars. Okay. And finally, I recommend this article. This is kind of the translation of official tutorial. Its flow is easy to follow and especially useful for Japanese speakers. And this can be applied to Mac as well, though it states Windows 10. Okay. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. So thank you for, and for your attention. So this was presented by Yuta Nomoto, and these are my GitHub and LinkedIn link. So if you are interested, please feel free to contact me anytime, anywhere. So it was a pleasure being here today. Thank you. Okay, Yuta, thank you so much. That was a really fascinating talk and yeah, just really excited to have seen that. So good job, otsukare sama and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Okay, so next up at two o'clock, we are going to have Eri Shimada, and she's going to be telling us how to get started with anime.js. So everyone, please be back here and ready to watch at 2 p.m. Thank you.
Okay, it's two o'clock and we're back. So next up is going to be Eri Shimada, and she is going to teach us how to get started with Anime JS. So, yeah, welcome, Eri. All right. Um, thank you, Heather. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my Tech Talk. Uh, I'm very excited to talk about how to get started with AnimeJS today. But today, before, uh, before we get, dive in, I'd like to introduce myself a little. My name is Eri Shimada. I'm from Saitama, Japan. And I used to work at the real estate company as an architect. So I was using 3D and CAD software and creating house plans most of the time. But after that, I decided to, uh, I found myself more interested in software side than just using it. So I decided to change my career. So that's why I'm here I am in Code Crisis today. Um, Animation is now very big in this world and people might think it's difficult to get started, but actually there are a lot of amazing libraries out there. So it's pretty easy to get started. So today I'd like to guide you to get like getting started with one of the popular animation libraries, AnimeJS. But before we dive in, Let's talk about why animation is important. There are many reasons why animation is important. Web animation can engage and hold people's attention longer than a static web page and communicates an idea or concept more clearly and effectively. Okay, so let's look at these images of two cats. Do you see the difference? The image on the right has a loading animation and on the left one, it doesn't. If you see this loading animation, you know it's loading, but without it, it's a little stressful to just wait what's gonna happen next. So to tell the user what's happening on the web page, the loading animation is very useful. Since loading animations are important even though we don't usually notice them. So I'd like to talk about loading animations a little more. What are good loading animations that users can enjoy? One, give time estimation. It can be a simple message of approximate time to wait or visual representation of work done, such as how many files have been uploaded so far, or how many minutes of minutes the software update will take. These UX design details can set the expectation and reduce the frustration. Next, two, explain why the user needs to wait. It's not always obvious why some apps or tools are not reacting instantly. Smart loading animation can give a reason to wait and explain what's happening under the hood. Three, make the waiting process fun and less frustrating. To reduce user's perfection of waiting time, it can be achieved by putting an engaging animation which keeps the user eyes busy. If you find something to grab user's attention while waiting, the time will seem to pass faster. It can be a catchy color combination, interesting or cute idea, or just like these cupcakes. So that's it for the loading animation one-on-one. -on -one. Let's take a look at other animations. So as you can see, the bottom on the left, it doesn't get clicked when you click it. 
But on the other hand, on the other hand, the button on the light, when you click it, you can see it gets clicked. This seems very simple, but this is also an animation. Eye-catching button animation entice users to click for reading more or slicing or an order. Another animation related to button animations. In this image on the left, if a user put a wrong info to the form and click the button, the form says no immediately, just like shaking its hand, head, like nope, so that user can quickly understand that something went wrong. In the image on the right, user can understand the process is successfully working from the confirmed view after the clicking button, which is very user friendly. Brand, brand and logo animations. Brand logo animations in UI design impress users and let them remember the brand or website easily. For example, it, this 2D logo animation has beautiful color gradient designs and vibrant colored birds, which is very easy to remember. This website is using all of the browser to show the fast view. Using the maximum height gives the user a strong impression of the website. But some users may not notice they can actually scroll down when the bottom line is actually the image line, bottom line. Because of that, this arrow icon, the scroll you can see, the animation helps users notice if you click it, you can scroll down. So let's move on to the next topic. Why use JavaScript for animation? Today, CSS offers transitions and animations to add movement to the web. However, when it comes to animation on the web, JavaScript is still a big player. Why? Animation can be static, stateful, and dynamic. For static, you can create just using CSS alone. Stateful, you can do with CSS and a little bit of JavaScript to remove the CSS classes responsible. But for dynamic, you might want to use what you might want to do with JavaScript. Now we've seen a lot of reasons why animation is important. So next, I'd like to introduce AnimeJS finally. And I will walk through the animation code during the demo. But first, what is AnimeJS? AnimeJS was created by Julian Gurnia in 2016. The most recent update was in April of this year. AnimeJS is described as a lightweight JavaScript animation library and with a simple yet powerful API. It works with CSS properties, SVG, DOM attributes, and JavaScript object. And AnimeJS supports many kinds of browsers such as Chrome, Safari, Opera, Firefox, and Internet Explorer. And also it's like MIT licensed, so you can use for your business. Okay, before diving into the demo, let's set up the AnimeJS first. So first, install AnimeJS package. You can just use npm install or yarn add AnimeJS. And then add the link to your HTML file just using script, script tag. Then create an anime object in your script file. That's it. Uh, an example of AnimeJS. I'd like to show you some examples using AnimeJS first. So let's move to some examples. So this is a login form. Um, this is using a snake highlight animation. So if you click this password focusing on, the line follows you. And if you click the submit, 
Wow, this is so cool. Uh, this is only written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And next one is this photo gallery animation. So for example, if you click, let's see, this image, you can see it's animating like very beautifully. So I think it'd be nice if you have something like this on portfolio. It might be nice. And last button click animation. So if you click this button, wow, you can see it's loading, done. So this button has both click animation and loading animation, which is very cool. So let's go back to the slide. Before we start demo, this is what Animate.js looks like. Animate.js provides a very simple API for animating elements. To create any animations using Animate.js, you will have to call anime function and pass it an object with key value pairs. That specify the target elements and the properties that you want to animate. Okay. So this is the animation we will be creating now. Demo time. All right, so let's move to J, uh, VS Code. So this is the first animation I'm going to show. This is very simple, basic animation. Uh, you can see the box goes from left to right. So let's see the HTML file. This is just, uh, I'm creating one box of div here. That's it. And in the CSS file, uh, I'm just uh, styling the height, uh, the size of the box and the color. And let's go to the script file. So only this much of code. You can use target on the line four, you can use the target key to tell AnimeJS which elements you want to animate. And the translate X is moving the X portion 300 pixels across the screen. So that's it, this is the basic. And let's add some more boxes. I added two more boxes here. And CSS is still the same. And what, how it looks like is like this. Wow, three boxes are moving. And let's see the script file. Okay, so first we're targeting all the elements on the page with the class name JS box like before and translate X. This is using a function to move each element depending on their index. So this is like index zero moves the first box to position zero amount and index one moves 50 and the index of two moves 100 like that. And next scale two, this is making each element twice as big. And the easing, this is setting an easing function to one of the predefined easing function, ease in out sign. And next delay, this is defining a delay for each element to perform all the property transitions. So index zero delay to start animation for the first element by zero times 20, that means zero milliseconds. And the index one delays to start after 20 milliseconds. And index two will be delayed to start after 40 milliseconds. And then next duration. This is defining the duration to be 12 millis 1200 milliseconds for each element to uh, set of transitions. And on the line 10, loop. This is just setting the animation to keep looping. And last, direction. This is telling the animate to alternate the animation direction from normal to reverse. So uh, setting the direction to alternate makes the animation play forwards and backwards repeatedly. And then let's all put together. 
So it's going to be that one I showed on the slides. Wow, this is very cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's see how I code it. So on the HTM file, I added more boxes here. And in the CSS file, this is just uh, styling the background color and the size of each box is here. And let's see the script file. So let me, let's see what, uh, let's see. and on, from the line five. So this is just targeting the class name like before and translate Y. This is simply animating each box's vertical A position from 150 to 50. And then background color, for the background color, it's using a function and setting a color for each box differently. And then duration, again, it is setting the duration to 900 milliseconds. And easing, this is defining an easing function like before. And delay, the delay for each box's animation is defined using a function. And loop is just telling the animation to keep looping. And direction, again, this is making animation loop forward and backward. So that this is it. This animation looks a little complicated, but all of the line, I, the code I wrote is just 15 lines of code. It's very simple. So next, I made another animation, very simple. So this is a card flipping animation. This is a, a Japanese English flashcard for children. So if you click card, you can see it's flipping and you see the nickel in the behind the card. So I, did, I added more cards like this. So I'd like to talk about how I code it quickly. So yeah, and uh, at, in the beginning, I'm just creating variables using query character from the class. And on the line 10, this is just adding click event to the, for the each card. And then let's see the anime function from line 14. First targeting the class like before, and then scale. This is how you can use the scale. It's changing the scale of the cards. And we rotate Y. So this is telling 180 is a complete flip that swaps front and back. And then again, using easing function and duration will be 400. So this is it, very simple. So that's it for the demo. Let's move back to the slides and let me wrap up. Okay, so pros and cons. For pros, AnimeJS is very easy to set up and also code is very simple and easy to understand. And there are many good examples you can find online, which is amazing. For cons, the documentation can be a little confusing, too hard to follow in the beginning. And also customization needs more information. So yeah, that's it for my presentation. Um, animation is very powerful. So it'd be nice if you add some animation to your portfolio so that you can impress recruiters or your friends. But when we learn something new, getting start is one of the most difficult part. And also we can, and we're always busy. But today I explained the first step very quickly. So maybe you can create some simple animation. So I hope you enjoyed it and hopefully it helps you even a little bit if you're interested in animation. And here's, here are my uh, GitHub and Twitter account. 
So I will appreciate any kind of feedback. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. Awesome, awesome work. That was really, really, really good. I'm sure everyone enjoyed your talk as much as I did. Um, and you're so right, you know, like the first steps of learning something can be really, really tough. But yeah, the most important thing to do is just to get started. And I think you helped us all with that today. So awesome work. Um, up next at 2.30 is going to be Tomoyuki. And he is going to tell us how to be lazy via webhooks. So I'm sure you guys are all as excited as I am to learn how to be maybe even lazier than you and I already are now. Um, so looking forward to that and see everyone back here at two o'clock.
Okay, welcome back everyone. It's now 2.30, which means it's time to get started with our next talk. So up next is going to be Tomoyuki, and he's going to be uh, explaining how to be lazy via webhooks because as we all know, uh, the best developers are people who are motivated by laziness. So let's give it up for Tomoyuki. Okay, welcome back everyone. It's now 2.30, which means it's time to get started with our next talk. So up next is going to be Tomoyuki, and he's going to be uh, explaining how to be lazy via webhooks because as we all know, uh, the best developers are people who are motivated by laziness. So let's give it up for Tomoyuki. Hello. Okay, welcome back everyone. It's now 2.30, which means it's time to get started with our next talk. So up next is going to be Tomoyuki, and he's going to be uh, explaining how to be Okay, okay. Today I want to talk about webhook and uh, how to become a, a type of lazy person like me. Okay, let's start. Today's goal: I want to introduce webhook. What is a webhook and how to use? And I want you to motivate to automate your repetitive work that bothers you. Bothers you. Okay, it's about me. I'm Tomoyuki, born in Japan. I worked as a software engineer for several types of companies. So I have some experience before joining TC. So I am interested in development for products that can make the drop some things so that bothers you and me. Okay, let's talk about webhook. Webhook is a user-defined HTTP callback. I will explain a bit uh, deeper later. So typically the format is, typically the format is JSON, now in the case format is HTTP post. A mechanism for your service that can be called by the other party service, not called, but by called. It is a basics of web webhook. So why webhook has value? Without webhook, when we want to know the status of other services, like uh, our, our development service is service A and the service B is like a depending services like a authentication, payment, some kind of stuff that provides API or things. So if I want to know the some event or status in service B, we should send many requests many times or what happens, what happens, what happens to you several times. But if we heard callback in the point, then service B simply can send message to our services when something happens to their service. This kind of uh, mechanism makes it easy to, for services to integrate each other. Uh, okay, I want to uh, talk about some real world example. This first one is Swipe. Swipe is one of the very famous payment API services. Maybe you can imagine that uh, if the, our development services uses Swipe payment services, 
state of consistency between two services are really, really important because if we believe that, oh, payment succeeded, so I can ship our product to our customer, but then Stripe failed. This is really a dangerous situation. So Stripe has webhook mechanism that can send us uh, some event uh, like a charge failed to customer or customer's uh, credit card expired or money like this. So, so payment results more easily handle these webhooks. Then next example is monitoring. Webhooks are widely used for monitoring services. Uh, Google Platform, uh, one of the most famous cloud platforms uh, development platform has a subdriver monitoring system that monitors computing instance and logging, like uh, how much usage of CPU memory or log have failed event, something like that. When detect some incident happens, computing instance or log, then monitoring push some notification to uh, bear webhook so we can detect what happens to our system. Next example, this will be the most famous use case for developers. Many of the services for developers have webhook mechanism. So we can easily integrate the system to system and build our own workflow. In this case, if developer push when de uh, when developer push code to GitHub, the GitHub triggers Circle CI, the one of the very famous uh, continuous integration services. Then Circle CI will return the result of build to webhook peer uh, result to GitHub via webhook. Then GitHub returns result to Slack via webhook. Okay, this is an example. Uh, next, I want to talk about automation. Uh, in our office, this kind of things really often happens for me. So each time I create request on GitHub, then ask for a review on Slack. Like, uh, oh, I created this request so anyone can review it. Like this. When triggers build on Jenkins, then build itself. So long, takes long time. So I will check after 10 minutes. Then I, when I start the work, then I have to create some Git branch, then link it to ticket management system. This type of uh, human powered work will often happen to our workspace. Uh, Larry, Larry Wall, he is a really, really famous programmer. He says laziness, impatience, superiors are the three virtues of software engineers. So as a software engineer, we should be lazy and impatient and humans. So it's time to you to be lazy to so then automate all the things. Uh, maybe you be you may think like uh, oh, okay, I'm a developer, software engineer, so I should be lazy, so I will start automation, but where to start? Where to start? So at first, you should notice the work you are doing repeatedly. Then know your tools well. Then design a new workflow that's sweet for you. So I will describe, I will explain them more details. Okay, at first, you will have some repetitive tasks in your daily life, like uh, go to your office, then fill some forms every day, 
or you do A, then do B type of repetition, like uh, create GitHub pull request, then ask someone to review. Okay, first you should find your manual repetitive tasks like this. Then, second, you should do is you know your tools. Modern tools are designed to receive events from various systems and also send events to other systems. So that means, well, the such kind of tools or services are combined, you can automate a lot of tasks really, really easy way. Really easy. Okay, then you know what bother, bothers you and know what you helps, uh, what helps you. So it's time, so you can automate. Okay, it's demo time. Okay, I use these three tools. First one is Slack, widely used communication tool. Second one is Toledo. Toledo is a task management tool. Then in this case, I assume it for like a biz and the data communication tool. So then get her code repository for the developer. Oops. Okay, I'll go to demo. Okay, I start in this case. We are talking about which tasks to do next. Okay, this is Dev, uh, Dev me and pro, uh, Project Manager me. So I, we decided to do user logout task next. So I will create, create Toledo tasks first. Yeah. Add user log art. Then tasks are created on Toledo user log out tasks here. Then I will set some comment. Some comment set sorry and set due today ten PM. It's very really hard work. Then task assigned assigned task. Me because uh, they assigned to me what happens then what happens to Toledo is just created task is created set do is set and the comment posted and assigned to me like this then I want to create GitHub issue as a software development side so. It might be automatically created after Toledo task created, the issue is automatically created here. However, uh, in this case, I use to connect Toledo to GitHub uh, by using that. That is uh, like uh, Google services to connect several services Toledo to GitHub, Toledo to Slack, GitHub to Slack, connect services easier. Then we have some automation tasks here, but it works at each five minutes. So in this case, I just use human power. So now, okay, that this is why after automation, we have or still have software engineering tools. So, okay, 
GitHub notify me new issue is created for Tolero. Then look at the GitHub. We have user logout issues here. Then like this. We when we start task, user login, Tolero ends up will automatically send me uh, what happens on Torero and also did her have some comment. You can notify me. So now Slack is not just a communication channel. All of the workflow are visualized here. So we don't need to check Torero. We don't need to check GitHub frequently. That will reduce some bothers, botherings, both uh, the things that bothers you. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to. Hmm? Let's go back to system overview. We use Slack, Torello, Zapier, Google Services, GitHub, and Slack. This is type integrated through APIs and Webhook. Webhook also API. So Webhook everywhere. It's that easy. I say, why I say easy, it is easy, is because it is so easy. <laughs> Uh, I created whole workflow on around 30 minutes or so. So it is so easy. So you can, it uh, costs really, well, it's really low cost. So you can start automation with really low cost that will reduce what you bothers you, what bothers you. Okay, in conclusion, Webhook is a user-defined HTTP callback. Many services uh, offer Webhook and can be easily integrated. So using this mechanism, you can easily automate your manual repetitive works. Okay, then your quality of life will be improved after that. Okay, thank you. This is my social account. And if you have some message, so please put your message to my webhook. Thank you. Okay, great job, Tomoyuki. Thank you so much. Um, I know all of us could use a little bit of extra time to do fun things or take it easy these days. So that helps us all automate our workflows and be a little bit more lazy. I love it. Um, okay, so thanks again for that, Tomoyuki. Next up, we're going to have Florian join us at 3 p.m., and he's going to be giving us a little bit about Docker. So I know you're all excited about that, and we'll see you back here at 3 p.m.
Okay, it's three o'clock. So welcome back to track A, everyone. Uh, those of you who may be joining us from track B, uh, great job and congrats to all of the speakers who finished over there. And thanks for moving on over to track A. So our final talk on track A for the afternoon is going to be from Florian, and he's going to talk to us about using Docker containers in Node apps. Um, fun fact about Florian, he's actually joined the course from Germany remotely. Um, so not only has he been, you know, sort of battling the boot camp battle, but he's been doing it in a really different time zone. And so I'm especially happy to be bringing you his talk this afternoon. And without further ado, let's give it up for Florian. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so thank you for joining my talk. Uh, my name is Florian and I want to talk about using Docker in your development process. So what we will have a look at today. First of all, I will start off with an introduction. So I want to clarify why would you even want to use Docker? And um, as soon as you're convinced that Docker is a good thing, I will try to explain you what is Docker exactly? And then my focus is about how to use Docker in your development process. So first of all, let's quickly introduce myself. Um, so as Heather mentioned, my name is Florian. I'm from Germany and I'm still here. I previously worked as a QA engineer and GitLab admin. So I had quite a few opportunities to work with. Docker already, but since my goal is working as a full stack engineer, um, I was also interested in using Docker specifically in the development process. So that's what we will have a look at today. So let me start off with the why. So maybe you had already a situation like this where one of your colleagues passes you some code or you just clone it and try to run it on your machine, but um, somehow it doesn't work on your machine there. It's just an error that's preventing the application from running on your machine. And um, yeah, you ask your colleague or friend what's what happened and he, he assures you the code definitely worked on his machine and he really has no idea why it's not working on yours because he tested it extensively. And there's obviously only one obvious solution to this, isn't there? You have to use his machine to make it work but that doesn't work so well for production or any other environments. Um, so maybe that was how Docker was born. Probably not, but Docker definitely delivers a solution to this problem. So now a little more into the facts, why you actually would use Docker. Um, for one, it definitely allows you for a cleaner software development process. So it allows you to wrap up applications, basically encapsulate them and create a clean and consistent runtime env environment for your applications. Um, you always know what variables and ports and uh, access rights are in running inside the container. So you don't have to worry about any outside influence. Also, the application deployment process is definitely simplified when using Docker. So it's quite easy to set up. I hope you can also agree on that when we look at the demo part. And it allows for portable applications because you can just uh, submit your container or the, the, the blueprint for the container and run the application inside there. Um, from a business view, it also increases the agility for business processes, which results in money saving. That's always a good argument. Um, because it allows for a very flexible adjustment. For example, when hardware resources are changing or the demand of your application is changing, then you can very easily adjust your Docker container or it does so automatically even. Um, also for, for VMs, virtual machines, you might have to consider more licenses and which you have to pay so we can also save money for uh, software in your containers. Okay, so what is Docker? I will just have a look at the very basic setup because Docker is a very big world and 
So we will only look at the three most basic parts of Docker, which is first the Docker file, where basically you just describe the commands that will create your, your container. And when you run this or when you build this Docker file, you get something called a Docker image. It's a little more abstract, so that's why I will just briefly explain it here. Uh, Docker image is comparable to like a template for a virtual machine. So you can predefine some values and settings for your virtual machine. And that's saved inside. If you use the Docker container, it's saved inside a Docker image. Um, you can store them Docker images outside of your environment and then so-called Docker hub. Usually it's comparably to something like GitHub. So it's just a remote repository where you can store those images. And you can compare it in terms of coding to a class that has not been instantiated. So if you instantiate it, so you basically run this image, you will get finally the Docker container. OK, let's have a look at the Docker file first. Um, I will run or we'll go over the commands a little bit later in the demo part. So don't worry about that. But in general, a Docker file is just describing with those commands you can see here and also uh, many more, um, the environment you want to create. It's a very lightweight, or it's, um, so from the Docker file, you create the image and the Docker file itself is usually stored along your code. So you can just push it to your code repository and check it out the next time or your colleagues. So it's definitely reusable. And it can be created manually or also with the help of a wizard of your coding environment you're using. So for example, later I will show you in Visual Studio Code. And yeah, we will have a look at more detail about the commands later. So let's have a look at the container itself. Um, yeah, the container is a little bit a mysterious box, but um, it's defined by its very lightweight uh, structure. So there are no unnecessary processes running inside. It's really small, just a few megabytes, not like when you create your virtual machine and you, you're talking more like gigabytes. Um, and it's basically just a runtime instance of an, uh, of an image. So you can actually work inside the container. So you can look inside and um, make changes there, although it's not recommended because it is supposed to be immutable. Also, a container has its own networks and ports and also its own ID, which is the way you address the container with commands. Um, you can also inspect the container to, to see more details about it, which we will do later. So to make it a little more visualizable, um, let's have a look at the comparison between Docker and virtual machines. So to the left, you can see uh, a system running on Docker. So we can see um, on the bottom, we have infrastructure, which is for common and for both. Uh, so both, of course, need some hardware to run on. And you can see for the Docker system, we have just one operating system. In my case, it would be just a Windows 10 version. And uh, on Windows, I have installed Docker. And Docker runs multiple applications, each in one container. On the other hand, we have a structure for virtual machines, which is, of course, both are simplified, but here we just assume that we also have an infrastructure and something called hypervisor, which is necessary for running uh, virtual machines. And as you can see, each virtual machine has its own guest operating system, which causes a lot of overhead. And you have to assign a, a lot of resources just for the guest operating system in itself. And you usually run a lot of processes inside here. So to have a look at the structure for enabling working with multiple containers, you can have a look at Docker Compose. So Docker Compose basically just allows uh, handling multiple containers. Um, so in this example, we can see container A is responsible for running an application and what, what is facing the user basically. So that's where the user can access the user interface. And in this example, in container B, we have the data pay base that, for example, could log some volumes to the outside, hopefully not to the public, but for the developers. 
And in Container C, we have the backend running. So for Docker Compose, it has its own commands, and you also use the own file. So it's not the Docker file, but the Docker Compose file. And it has its own YAML format, so-called. And that's also what we will have a look later in the sample application. So let's have a look at the development process with Docker. So you would start just as usual, coding your application or whatever you're building. And when you're done with that, you would write a Docker file, or maybe it's already there if you're continuing on a project that already exists. And even better, you could either create an image from that Docker file, or you could just draw or pull an image from the repository. For example, you could have an repository internal of your to your company that you can just use the images from. Um, no matter how, in the end, we you want to run a container or compose if you want to run multiple containers. And inside that container, we can test our application. And hopefully, all our tests run well. And we can push the code to the code base. And you can pass the task to the QA team. And um, probably, they will find some errors. And you will have to adjust a little bit your code and do the process again. But eventually, you hopefully get through the QA team and they approve of your changes, and you can push your code to production environment. OK, so let's have a look at more detail at the development process. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, you would write your code, and you could edit or add a Docker file, or just use an image, and then run the container to test the application. Um, now let's have a look at how this would look inside a con uh, coding environment, actually. So here we see a very simple project, for an example, just a task manager using Docker. So we can use a folder or see a folder structure that's just relevant for the application itself. But we can also see some files that are um, just here because of Docker. So very easy one is here the Docker ignore. It has the same purpose as the git ignore file you might know. So you can just um, con collect all the files or folders you don't want to appear in your container here. Then we also have the most important part, probably a Docker file, um, which we have look into more detail in a moment. Um, but what I will look at now is first the, uh, OK, now it's working, uh, the add-on for Docker inside Visual Studio Code. So you can very easily, without leaving Visual Studio Code even, access your containers. So at the moment, all of them are stopped. Nothing is running. But you can just start and stop them from the interface here. You can see all the images which are stored here when you um, build them. And you also have access to your registries, networks, and volumes, which is just a fancy word for storage outside of a container. OK, so for now, let's head back to the slides. Um, testing, also an important part of development process, of course. So part of it will you, you will do yourself, but also the QA team, probably. Um, and it's very similar to the development process. You just run the container, pull code changes, and start testing inside the container. But of course, there is also another way, which is probably more relevant even. So. Um, you could also automate your tests. And that's really where Docker shines a lot. Um, so imagine you have your development team. And that development team pushes codes to the repository, or code changes to the repository. And now, thanks to Tomiyoki, we also know what webhooks are. So GitLab or Jenkins or any CI CD tool of, uh, you like um, will detect those changes basically through a webhook. And when it detects those changes, it will trigger a lot of stuff. A pipeline, it's called. And it's, so that pipeline usually contains a lot of commands. For example, you will describe what kind of image you want to use. And based on that image, you will run a container. And inside that um, container, you will clone your code changes. And you could run some tests automated. So here in the sample setup, we see, for example, SonarCube running some code analysis for, for example, potential security flaws or potential bugs, and running just for unit tests and Selenium for some end-to-end -end tests. 
And hopefully all your tests pass and in the end your changes will be merged to the main branch. If not, your development team will be notified that something went wrong. So after testing went well, we hope we can proceed to production. And for production, you definitely want to make sure that the users have the best experience of your application. So you might want to monitor your Docker container and everything that's running inside. So here we see an example with Prometheus, but also Grafana is very possible. And you can keep an eye on the uptime of your applications and services and also about the resource usage and if your application is doing well, just overall. And another, another important topic is, of course, security. So for a production environment, you will enforce strict security rules, probably, hopefully. And Docker supports all the Linux security features like um, store, uh, it's like namespaces or uh, control groups, and also brings some features on its own. So here we just have a look at a very few. So <laughs> there are so many that Docker security in itself is a very big topic. But for example, it brings um, image signing. So the images you are using have to be signed. You can enforce that rule so that you make sure that nobody fiddled with the images. Also, you can natively encrypt the, the data flow between containers so that you also in, have a safer uh, communication between the containers. And there are many, many more, but <laughs> that's too much for this talk. So let's briefly touch also volumes, which I mentioned earlier. Um, but that's basically just a fancy word for storage outside of your Docker container. But that's, of course, very important because you want to save some data permanently or persistently. And that's not ensured if you just have the data inside your container. Also, you might want to handle a lot of containers, for example, for microservices, which is when you would use um, tools like Docker Swarm or Kubernetes for handling those, the number of containers which are then used in a procedure called nodes. But now let's have a look at the more practical part so you hopefully can imagine it a little better. So we will now proceed to the demo and quickly let me uh, explain the, the application I want to show you. It's just a very simple task manager API and a super simple user interface running with Express, Node.js, and MongoDB. So let's move to the demo part. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we definitely need a Docker file. And for that, we um, want to have a look at the commands quickly. So on the first command, I hope you can read it well. Um, we can see that we pull an image, an official image from Node. So we run our application in Node. And it's an Alpine image, which is just a very, very lightweight um, Linux distribution. Then on the second file, we see that we create an environment variable called production, because we want to um, run our application in a production environment. And on line three, we define a working directory uh, in the source folder. On line four, we copy a few files um, to our container, namely the package or JSON and JSON log, um, which we need to run the following command, run this command npm install uh, in the production environment. So we will install all our dependencies. Uh, we want it to be silent so we don't get any unnecessary output. And the best practice is also to, to force a clean cache to always ensure a clean environment and we move all the node modules and node modules folder out. Then we have two copy commands. Um, basically, they just consist of two values. On the left, we have um, what is outside of the container, so the origin, and to the right, we see where we want to copy it, so inside the container, and two times. And we expose port 3000. We could expose any port if we want, but that's just basically where we want to access our application later. And finally, we run the command node uh, index.js just to start our application. So if I want to build that image through this um, Docker file, I would run a command like docker build minus, uh, dash t, 
uh, with T standing for tag, and I don't, don't define the tag, just the name, task manager Docker, and I provide the current directory as the context where I want to build it from. That was very fast um, because there were new, new changes for the Docker file. So we just basically copied our image that was already existing and we get a successful output. Um, and you can see it's assigned a unique ID and also the, the name was used and also the tag latest with just the version. Now let's have a look at Docker Compose. Um, Docker Compose, as I mentioned, is for handling multiple containers. And here we just define services that we run, basically two containers we want to create. Uh, one is web, so that will be our application, and one is Mongo, that will be our database. And inside the application, we want to build a container based on the image we just built, task, task manager Docker, uh, in the current directory. And we want to run the command to start the application. And we define some environment variables, which is not best practice here that you define your secrets here and so on. But just for our demonstration purposes, it's definitely um, easier to visualize if it's just contained here. Also, we define the ports. So it will be port 3000 inside the container will be assigned to port 3000 outside of the container. And we say that it's depending on Mongo because we definitely need the database for our application in our case. And uh, Mongo service is just, um, we pull an image from the official Mongo, so the official Mongo image we just use, and we also assign some ports. So if we want to build that image from the Docker Compose file, we just use Docker Compose build, and it will behave very similar because has already created the image, so it will be very quick. Um, but we also get the successful output. So in the end, to run our application and to just show you um, on localhost 3000, you can see now nothing is running, so it's not working. I'm not secretly running the application somewhere else. Um, but when I start the Docker Compose containers, and we can see a lot of output, um, but in the end, we can also see that our server is up on port 3000 and it's successfully connected to the database. So let's have a look. And we can see it worked. So now we can actually click around here, but it's just a very simple application. So definitely works and we can reach the application. So let me head quickly back to the presentation. Um, yes, to wrap this up, I want to just quickly summarize the, the Docker topic uh, about what Docker actually does and what it doesn't do. So for one, uh, Docker definitely does help to use resources more efficiently. It scales, scales very well with your um, host system, so you don't need to uh, interact or in a, intervene very often because it does a lot of um, the resource handling automatically. Um, but of course you can also do manually. Um, it also enables faster software delivery cycles in general. So since it's very easy to set up and you can just share the configuration very easy with other people and other departments. So it's very, or it's quicker to set up and also increases the portability, portability uh, because of that reason. So you just create the environment you need for your application and you can create it anywhere just from the Docker image. Um, what Docker doesn't do is replacing virtual machines. Although you often can use Docker instead of virtual machines, there are some cases you might need to use virtual machines. For example, for legal reasons, you might need to use a virtual machine in some cases. Um, then also the topic microservices is pretty popular recently. Um, Docker does help with it, definitely. So you can run all your services in different containers, but it doesn't do automatically for you. So you definitely have to provide the architecture that it's suitable for microservices. And finally, I also want to mention that Docker does bring a lot of security features with it, but it doesn't solve all your security concerns and you definitely need to keep an eye on security on your, on your own. Okay, so that are a few of the sources I used. And finally, I just want to thank you and hope you 
got something out of this talk and if you haven't done so already, I hope you um, might give Docker a try, especially in, for development. And if you have any questions or just want to get in contact with me, feel free to do so through GitHub or through LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Florian. Um, I heard from one of the other students here that you're doing this talk for us at 8 a.m. And that's, uh, that's, that's incredible. So I think that we all had a really good time listening to your talk. And yeah, please do get in touch with Florian if you want to know more about Docker. Um, so we are going to wrap up our, our event with this, but I just have a couple of announcements that I want to make for you. So just a moment, I'll share my screen here. Okay, um, so I hope that you enjoyed all of the talks that you saw in track A and track B tonight. Um, our students work incredibly hard, you know, having only six weeks as, you know, junior, like new developers to, to come up with something like this and share it with the community is an incredible feat. And please join us all in congratulating them. Um, so I just want to let you know about a couple of upcoming events. So September 24th, which is a Thursday, is going to be CC13's Demo Day. Uh, so let's see what they're able to do over the next month. I know I'm looking forward to it. Um, September 25th, the very next day, is going to be our uh, Japanese second Japanese immersive and CC14 API night. Um, and this is going to be with Stripe. Uh, and finally, I want to let you know, we have mentioned this at our events before, but we do have a campaign for Friends of CC, so just say that you came to this event, to get 15% off of our foundations course, um, and that is going to run until August 31st. So if you're a new developer and you're impressed like I am with the fact that these students were able to do this in just six weeks, um, I recommend, and you don't know where to start, I recommend checking foundations out. Um, so also I want to let you know some upcoming dates. So we have upcoming immersive starting at the end of September in November and also next year in January. Um, our Japanese classes, if you are a uh, Nihonjin who wants to study programming in Nihongo, uh, or anybody who wants to study in programming in Nihongo actually, um, we have classes starting in August and which is happening now and also uh, November and next February. So we also have some foundations classes starting soon. So in English, that's gonna be uh, actually starting next Tuesday and then a couple of weeks after that and then again in October. Um, kind of the same with the Japanese foundation starting earlier next week. Uh, August and September and October. So please, please, please um, check us out, join some of these classes and join our amazing community. Um, seriously, y'all, we could not do this without you and uh, you you give us life and you know we keep going and, and keep growing because of you. So thank you so much and please welcome to the new community members. And with that, I wanna say thank you so much and congratulations to CC13 presenters today. Well done, everyone. Um, I hope everyone enjoys their Saturday afternoon, and we will see you again at Demo Day. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Goodbye.